Well, good evening. It is certainly a privilege and an honor to be speaking to you this evening. I'm very grateful to the elders who have given me this opportunity. And to those of you who are visiting with us, we want to say welcome. We are so glad that you chose to join us for a period of worship and study of God's Word tonight. I hope you brought your Bible with you because there's a lot of Scripture that I want to get through. So if you would, go ahead and take out your Bible and turn with me to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews will begin reading together there in chapter 8 in just a moment. And while you're turning there, I want to tell you just a little bit about the relationship that I have with my father-in-law. I count myself very lucky, very blessed to have an excellent Christian man as my father-in-law, and he and I have, for the past seven years, had a tradition of making time every year, once a year, to get together and work on some kind of project. It might be fixing a fence, it might be fixing a leaky faucet, it might be cutting down a dead tree in their backyard, whatever it is. The point of our time together is not the project. The focus is on the conversations that we have. Each year, we get to catch up on things that have happened to us in the past year. We get to celebrate our successes and commiserate over our failures together as husbands. But more than that, more than that, we talk about ways in which we have seen God's truth and his word made manifest to us in our experiences in the past year. And I want to share with you one of those stories that he shared with me two years ago. One morning, he was getting ready for work. He was uh, in his bedroom putting on his suit, and he noticed that the mirror in the master bathroom had been broken. The frame was intact, but the glass had been completely shattered. There was no way that you could see a clear reflection of your appearance. It was just a tangled spider web of cracks. And so, he decided to replace the mirror that weekend. He got out his tools, he went to the store, he bought a new mirror, a bigger mirror, and he took down the old, broken mirror and set it aside to be thrown away and replaced it with a new one. Well, then imagine his surprise the next day when he was getting ready for work and his wife was in the closet, also looking at a mirror, a broken mirror, a mirror that had not been thrown away but had been saved. And that led to an interesting conversation. He said, I bought you a new mirror. I bought you a bigger mirror, a better mirror, one that's not broken, one that shows an accurate reflection. Why are you using this one. And her response was, well, two mirrors are better than one. If something should happen to the new mirror, I want a backup. I want something else I can turn to in case the first isn't good enough. Now, before we go on, I just want to say I love my mother-in-law. She is a wonderful, wonderful Christian woman. And I'm not ascribing any moral value tonight to the number of mirrors you may happen to have in your house, nor am I suggesting that when we sing a song of encouragement that you need to come forward and confess sin if you have a broken mirror in your house. That's not my point. But I want to ask us tonight to think for a few moments on the question that my father-in-law asked me. Does Scripture teach that there are things which should not be kept on standby, things that cannot be kept in reserve in case something else that has been given to us should prove insufficient. And as we worked, as we worked in the yard that day, together we came up with four things, four things that we found in Scripture where God's word teaches us we cannot add new on top of old, but we must replace the old with the new. Four things that I want us to look at tonight. Let's begin with the old and the new covenant. Read with me, if you will, in Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is... Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old covenant as he mediates a better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. And then in verse 13, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete is growing old and is ready to vanish away. Now, If the new covenant, then, is so much better, if the old covenant was the shadow, the broken mirror, if you will, that showed a dim view of things to come, something better that would come and replace it, then surely no one would object to the law being nailed to the cross, to the old covenant being replaced with something new, the faulty covenant being replaced with a faultless covenant. 
Surely no one would be so foolish as to try to add the new covenant on top of the old, thereby cluttering up the religious landscape, placing a heavy yoke and a burden on believers, making Christ's mercy and grace unapproachable. Surely that would never happen. Right? If you're familiar at all with the Bible story, you know that this exact thing happened. And in fact, it was a problem from the very beginning of the church. We can read an account of this happening in Acts 15. We won't read the entire chapter for the sake of time, but I do want to draw your attention to a few verses in particular. Beginning in verse 1, we read that certain men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the elders were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. Then in verse 5, when they were in Jerusalem, some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. I want you to notice Peter's response here in verse 10. He says, now therefore, why are you putting God to the test and placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? James responds in verse 19, Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. And so, in verse 28, the apostles and the council of elders with them determine that they will write a letter and send it to the Gentiles, saying, For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, you do well. Now, you would think that if the apostles themselves gather together and with the authority of the Holy Spirit behind them, write a letter to you and send it to you telling you what you should and should not be teaching, surely that would be enough. Surely that would be the end of the argument. The argument would be settled. No one would have any confusion about the place of the old and the new law. And again, if you're familiar at all with the story of Scripture, if you're familiar with Paul's writings, you know that that was not the case. Paul has to sharply rebuke some teachers in Titus chapter 1, where, beginning in verse 10, he says, There are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not. In verse 13, then, this testimony, he says, is true Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish fables and the commands of the people who turn away from the truth. And so he has to write a correction, right? He has to correct the Galatians. In Galatians chapter 3, he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. So let me ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? And then in chapter 5, he'll say, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be tested, excuse me, you are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. And of course, we can go back to the book of Hebrews where we began, the whole thesis of which is that Christ is superior to Moses, the new covenant is superior to the old, the blood of Christ is far superior to the blood of bulls and goats, which could never on their own take away sin. Now, for the Jews, this idea that the new covenant was not simply an addition, an appendix to the old law, but it was something new that would replace the old law entirely. That idea for them was a stumbling block. But the Greeks, the Gentiles, had a different problem. You see, for them, the idea of Christ being crucified and then resurrected was utter foolishness. You'll recall how the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers of Acts chapter 17 thought Paul was just an idle babbler. They said, he has no idea what he's talking about. And so Paul has to warn the church in Colossians, in Colossians chapter 2, against the influence of philosophers like these, where he writes in verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. See, just as Paul writes in Galatians, 
that we cannot add the new law on top of the old. Rather, we ought to replace the old law with the new. In 1 Corinthians, he will go to great lengths to insist that we cannot add the wisdom of God on top of the philosophy of the world. We are instead to replace the wisdom of the world with the wisdom of God. Read with me, if you will, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Paul says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where then is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame those things which are mighty. And I want you to notice not just the distinction that he makes between the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of God, but also how he describes his own preaching as he continues into chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, where he says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet, among the mature we do impart wisdom, Although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and a hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Of course, if you stop and think about it for a minute, it really shouldn't come as a shock to you that the wisdom of the world would stand in contrast to the wisdom of God. There are two different worldviews that each ask you to do two different things. According to the world, the best advice that that can be given is if you have worldly possessions, you ought to tear down your barns and build greater, that you may lay up for yourself even more treasure on earth. That then you can say to yourself, I have many goods laid up for many years. I can eat, drink, and be merry. But of course, if you remember the parable of the rich fool in Luke 12, God says that is foolishness. Tonight, he says to the fool, your soul is required of you, and then whose will all these things be? You see, in God's mind, in God's plan, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment, Hebrews 9 and verse 27. And in contrast, if you look through the broken mirror, if you will, the twisted and distorted vision that the world sees through their perception of wisdom, why would God's plan, God's wisdom, not appear to them to be foolishness? Because God's wisdom dictates that you should not lay up for yourself treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. See, these two philosophies, they're completely incompatible. They're like oil and water. You cannot hold both tenets, both worldviews at the same time. You cannot add God's wisdom on top of the world's wisdom, and you cannot add the world's wisdom on top of God's wisdom. Each philosophy, each school of thought, each worldview declares the other to be the height of folly. And so if you're going to be consistent, if you're going to hold a self-consistent worldview, then you're forced to make a choice. You have to choose between the two. And if you're going to follow God, if you're going to seek after God's wisdom, then you must do so by replacing the world's wisdom. Certainly don't do the reverse. If you recall in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 20, Paul describes the state of the unrighteous and the ungodly. He says, beginning in verse 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, 
birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And just like a broken mirror will show you a twisted and distorted perception of your own appearance, for all the philosophy, for all the wisdom that these ungodly people claim to have, their perception, their view of the way things are, became similarly twisted. It became distorted. Their wisdom became foolishness, and their hearts were darkened. And so, you might ask them, what's the problem? Why can you not hold both the philosophy of man and the wisdom of God in harmony at the same time? I would argue that it's because of what Jesus had to say in Luke chapter 16, where he said, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And according to the wisdom of the world, that should be your aim. You should seek your own gain. You should seek to serve the self. You should seek to lay up goods in store for yourself. And so through that lens, through that view of the world, we see that in verse 14, the very next verse, The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all of these things, and they ridiculed him. Looking through the broken mirror, the distorted reflection of the way the world is, God's plan appears to be foolishness. Just like you can't add the new law on top of the old law, and just like you can't add God's wisdom on top of man's wisdom, you similarly cannot add a love of God on top of a pre-existing love for things of this world. You must replace one with the other. You can't have them both. John writes in 1 John, beginning in chapter 2 and verse 15, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away and the lust thereof, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And of course, Just like with the warning that the apostles had to send by letter in Acts 15, that didn't stop the Jews from trying to add the new law on top of the old. Jesus' warning that no man can serve two masters certainly hasn't stopped people from trying. Arguably the most well-known example of this in Scripture is probably in 2 Timothy chapter 4, where Paul's writing about Demas, who he says was in love with this present world and has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. But there's another one, I think one that's less often talked about that I want to draw your attention to. It's in the account in John of the anointing in Bethany. We read, beginning in verse 3, that Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this, John notes for us, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what had been put into it. So when presented with a choice, Judas chose to help himself instead of helping the poor, taking advantage of his position, using it, if you will, as taking advantage of liberty as a cloak for vice. You see, you cannot serve both God and money at the same time. Judas could not help both the poor and himself, and so he chose to help himself. Now, many will not even get that far. They will choose not to follow Jesus at all, rather than choose to abandon their love for their possessions. You recall the story of the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10, where in verse 21, Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Verse 22 tells us that he was disheartened by this saying and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. When we talk about a love of the things of this world and the caution that we need to have in our hearts when we think about the things in this life, oftentimes we kind of restrict ourselves just to our financial possessions. But scripture doesn't take that narrow of a view. Recall the words of Jesus where he said in Matthew 19, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life, Matthew 19 and 29. And John in Revelation chapter 12, when he's describing the scene of Satan being cast down from heaven, writes in verse 10, And they, being the brethren, have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Now, it might seem daunting to you, as I'm sure it did to that rich young ruler, to lay aside not just your money, but also your home, your land, your country, and even if it should come to that, 
your own family, being willing even to put your own life on the line to follow Jesus. But you have an assurance. You have an assurance given to the disciples in John chapter 14 by none other than Christ himself, where he said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will surely come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Paul is clearly anticipating that day when he writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Now, human wisdom would dictate that if you're going to make such a drastic commitment, if you're going to make such a significant change in your life, if you're going to give up everything, your wealth, your fame, your fortune, even your home, your country, perhaps even your family, maybe even your life, that you should have a backup plan, something else that you can turn to just in case this whole Jesus thing doesn't quite work out. We talked this morning about how often Peter was a rock uh, and how often he was a vocal supporter of Jesus, but I often find it interesting that you can use Peter as sort of a litmus test for Jesus' popularity. You'll recall that when Jesus is being followed, thronged by the multitudes, Peter is always very enthusiastic. In Mark 10 and Luke 18, Peter says, See, we have left everything and followed you. And in John 6 and 68, he says, To whom shall we go, Lord, when you have the words of eternal life? See, when Jesus is popular, Peter is right there with him. He is excited to be there. But then, when Jesus begins to be unpopular, when Jesus is arrested and led away to the high priest in Mark 14, Peter follows at a distance and lingers in the courtyard, not willing to confess that he is one of Jesus' disciples and will eventually deny his Lord. And then finally, after Christ's death in John 21, Peter decides to return to fishing. This isn't in the text, but I, can, I often think that you can almost hear a sort of a sigh of resignation in Peter's voice as he says this. It's a sense of, it's unfortunate that didn't work out. Anyway, I'm going fishing. Now, it might seem wise, according to the world's perception of wisdom, to take that path, to follow Jesus closely when he's popular, to follow at a distance when he's unpopular, but there'd be no shame in returning to your past life if Christianity isn't working out for you. But remember that Jesus said in Luke 9 and verse 62 that no one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom. You can't just add Christianity on top of your existing life in the world. You can't just add church to your weekly planner on Sundays and, you know, maybe Wednesdays too if you're feeling extra holy that week. That's not how it works. You have to replace your old life entirely with a new one. You can't live two lives at the same time. Paul goes to great lengths in chapter 6 of the book of Romans to, to make this point painfully clear. What shall we say then, Romans 6 and verse 1? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer therein? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, according to Paul, there is no room whatsoever for some of self and some of thee, as we often sing. You cannot both walk in light and in darkness at the same time. You cannot live two lives, just as you cannot add the new covenant on top of the old, just as you cannot add God's wisdom on top of the world's philosophy, and just as you cannot add a love of God on top of a love of the things of this world you similarly cannot add Christianity on top of a life in sin. You cannot use liberty as a cloak for vice. You cannot continue living in sin that grace may abound. 
Just as the Jews were instructed to lay aside the old law and replace it with the new, just as the Gentiles were instructed to lay aside the philosophy of their thinkers and replace it with God's wisdom, just as we are called to replace a love of the things of this world with a love of God, we are also called to completely, wholly and utterly forsake the life that we once lived in sin and replace it with a new life in Christ. So the old law had a place. It had a function, but it was flawed. It was always meant to be a schoolmaster, something to point us in the direction, to show us a dim vision, a view through a broken mirror, if you will, of something better, the new covenant that would replace it one day. Just as the Jews were not allowed to keep it on standby, just in case the new law wasn't good enough to save them, just in case the blood of Christ could not take away their sin, just as the Gentiles were not allowed to keep the wisdom, the philosophy of their thinkers on standby, just in case God's plan wasn't wise enough for them. Just as the rich young ruler was not allowed to keep all of his wealth on standby, just in case he needed it, in case following Jesus proved to be too difficult. We are not permitted to keep that old life, those old sins, hidden away, as it were, in a closet somewhere, just in case we decide we want to go back to them later. Again, Paul asks, how shall we who died to sin live any longer therein? Instead, he'll say in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 22, that we are to put off the old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. Paul will tell us in Philippians that we ought to let go of those things which are behind and reach out toward those things which are ahead. Let go of the old law, replace it with the new Let go of man's wisdom, replace it with God's wisdom. It's freely offered. He'll give it to any who asks. James 1 and verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. We must let go of our love of the things of this world and lay up for ourselves instead treasure in heaven. We must let go of our old life and reach out toward the new life, the new walk in Christ, anticipating something special, anticipating a day when we can finally let go of something else. We can let go of this earthly home and reach out to meet our Lord in the air on the way toward a heavenly home, finally letting go of these mortal bodies and reaching out as the mortal embraces immortality together with him. And so tonight, it may be that you realize that you have not yet fully replaced that old life with the new life. It may be that there is still one little sin, something that you've kept tucked away in the closet just in case you decide you want to go back to it later. If that's the case, why not repent? Won't you come confessing that sin, letting us pray with you and for you that you might be restored? Or perhaps you have not yet made that all-important decision to die to sin, to put the old man to death that you might live as the new. So let me ask you, why not tonight? Why not place your faith in a new covenant one which is so much better that it has superseded the old. Why not lay aside the philosophy of the world that you might seek the wisdom of God? That path will be difficult, as along the way you'll have to lay aside your treasure on earth that you might lay up for yourself treasure in heaven. But there are many wonderful, loving brothers and sisters here who will love you and who will walk with you on that journey, as together we all long for the day when these earthly tents are replaced with heavenly homes and our corruptible body is replaced with incorruptible. So tonight, if you need to die to sin, if you need to replace a broken mirror, if you need to let go of what lies behind, that you might reach out toward what lies ahead, then won't you come, penting and confessing Christ before men, being baptized into his death, that you might replace a life that is old with a life that is new. If we can help you in any way, won't you come?